Warning, please be aware the views on this podcast are limited to the individual or individuals that are speaking and only pertain to them as it relates to the topic at They are limited to time, date, voter registration district, favorite kind of chocolate bar, top hats or ball caps, and whether Saturn, Mercury and Uranus are in alignment with the sun on the fifth day of the seventh month in the year of the eagle while you're riding your motorbike backwards up a hill. Thank you for your understanding. Goodbye. What is up, weirdos? You're listening to The Manic Pixie Weirdo. I'm Abigail, your host, and this is the podcast where we talk about all the different kinds of relationships that we have in our life. And this week, we are joined by Dr. Michelle Finnerin um, to talk about um, the psychology of abuse and her book. Uh, so go ahead and say hi, Mich- uh, Dr. Michelle, and then tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm really excited okay. to talk to you. Thank you, Abigail, for having me on your important podcast. I really appreciate it. My name is Dr. Michelle Finneran, and I have been a psychotherapist for about 25 years now. I started off really young in community mental health, about um, 10 years, 10, 10, 11 years in community mental health, and then 12 years in my private practice called Beck and Associates in Coral Springs, Florida, which is in South Florida. And um, recently what I've been doing is um, having the private practice and seeing clients on an individual level. I see, you know, adolescents, um, teens, um, adults, um, marriages and families. Um, But I also, my my practice is really made up of first responders, um, law enforcement, um, firefighters, um, nurses, anybody who's really on the front lines, um, people helping people is who I really, really try to help. So I, that, that's what my practice is really made up of. Um, this past this past year in 2020, um, I um, published a book by Rutledge Taylor and Francis called Surviving Domestic Abuse, Formal and Informal Supports. And it talks about uh, what I did is that's a research, it's a research book that I um, surveyed um, and interviewed uh, a phenological qualitative um, study on survivors of domestic abuse and how what and how formal supports and informal supports help them abolish their d- domestic abuse relationship. So it was very interesting, a lot of saturation with the information, meaning I was hearing the same things over and over again with these interviews. So it was just a very interesting um, um, interviews for me to do a very, an, uh, such an honor for me to have the, done these interviews and to really, you know, compilate all the data and really analyze it and put it in a book format for people to kind of get into the know. It's really a book for survivors or victims, but it's also a book for people that anybody who's helping victims in the, in their struggle. So uh, we're talking about like law enforcement, we're talking about um, lawyers, judicial systems, counselors, priests, clergy, um, medical medical field. We're also talking about informal supports, which are friends, families neighbors, um, co-workers, supervisors. So I really look at a systems approach um, to how to go about helping um, a, a victim population. Oh, wow. That's that's fantastic. Wow. I'm so Thank honored you. to have you here. That's amazing. Thank you um, so much. So let's just get right into it. Uh, sure. So does, uh, I would assume rightly or wrongly so, that abuse does have an effect on the brain. Uh, Could you, does it? And then could you tell us a little bit about the different kinds of abuse and how they affect the brain? Do they affect the brain in different ways? Yes. Um, Yeah. So uh, abuse does affect the brain because childhood abuse or, or um, domestic abuse uh, or neglect or trauma, it changes the brain structure and chemical function. Um, maltreatment, maltreatment can also affect how people behave, um, how they regulate their emotions and how they function on a day-to-day basis. So it's very much, it's kind of intertwined. Everything is kind of interconnected. Um, <clears throat> One of the potential effects that can include just being constantly on guard and alert and being a very, having a lot of angst and anxiety and being, uh, having a very challenging time relaxing, no matter what situation it may be. And, you know, emotional abuse can cause a great amount of stress and people's bodies react to stress by 
releasing hormonal cortisone. And this hormone can damage and reduce the function of your hippo, hippopotamus. So um, basically the area of the brain, which is associated with learning and memory. Oh, wow. Uh, yes. So does that mean that like, sorry, d d does that just mean that uh, it can affect the way that you remember things? Or is it like you don't have any memory of it at all? Like what? Or is it both? I don't. It's, it, can you hear me? Oh, my gosh. I'm so sorry. Something happened and it just like stopped. Okay. Uh, so let's just go back. Uh, okay. And I was asking you about memory. Uh, yes. So can you can you uh, elaborate a little bit of that? Okay. Sure. Sure. So with, with that being said, a lot of people that suffer from trauma what ends up happening is because they're so tra traumatized, they end up having blocked memories, blocked. And so that's when, when you have a blocked memory or a block, you can't recollect or recall certain childhood experiences or experiences happening in an abusive relationship. So you, you have a sense of a repressed or blocked memory and trauma does do that. And it also affects, you know, short-term and long-term memory as well. It really affects the frontal lobe of the brain, which, which is that it talks about like the learning and the memory. So the short-term memory and the long-term memory can also be affected, but also the ability to recall and the ability to, you know, push down so far down that there is a there's a a blank. People when the people when people have been through a lot of trauma, and I, I go to interview them, they have a very hard time describing their childhood because a lot of it has just been blocked because of the trauma because of the trauma that they've experienced. So. Yes, it has effect on the it has effect on the memory. It has effect on learning as well. Your concentration and your focus is just not there. And um, people need certain elements to kind of relax. A lot of people have gotten into like scrolling on their phone, some sort of technical stimulation to kind of decompress and re <coughs> excuse me, relax, which doesn't really do the trick. Right. <clears throat> what, what ends up happening is um, that creates more stimulation. So with that being said, um, <clears throat> learning, concentration, focus, um, trying to stay, um, you know, task driven becomes very, very challenging for someone who's experienced a, a, a abuse and how it affects the brain and learning components and memory components. So how I get my guess, my immediate question is <clears throat> how does one begin to, would you, would you want to immediately like bring these memories to the surface or are you, or are you first going to like, uh, look at the learning and like how, the ability to learn and like how it's affecting the ability to like, which one are you going to look at first? Or are you going to look at both at the same time? You're, you're definitely not going to look at the, both of them at the same time. What you're going to look at first is what's interfering in the, in the functioning first. Okay. What's interfering in the functioning? Is it, is it, is, is there your past trauma interfering so much in your day-to-day -day functioning does that need to be addressed or does it, your ability to focus and concentrate, is that interfering on a day-to-day? -day? So whatever is interfering in your functionality is what we're going to target because obviously, you know, when, when someone comes to me, they're, they're somehow, they're somehow having a presenting issue. And that's right. the reason why they're coming to me. That's impeding their level of functioning. So my goal as a therapist is to improve and maximize as much as I possibly can with strategies and goals and techniques to maximize their level of functioning. And so whatever know. is, whatever is impeding that level of functioning is what I'm going to attack first. Okay. Okay. Um, so what, are there any other like symptoms uh, that like abuse will take on the brain or are those really like the big two the learning? No, learning? no. Um, um, 
there's there's all kinds of things when when you come to children's when it comes to trauma what has something to do with children in early childhood it can result in disrupted attachment Mm. it can result in cognitive delays it can result in an impaired emotional regulation and um it's these this this uh, overdeveloped or underdevelopment of certain um certain early brain chemistries can lead to impairment later on in life. So it it, it does a it's a it's a slew of just not um, physiologically impairments, mm-hmm. but also behavioral and social impairments as well. So this is this the, these childhood early childhood traumas, if not addressed, you know earlier on, leads to adult it progresses in impairment later on in life. And that's, that's, that's when adults come to realizing that they have, they've had some issues from the past that have not been resolved or have not been um, um, worked through or processed. And that's why a lot of adults come in for therapy in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. That was uh, a big reason why I started going to therapy too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, What? So like, I, I, I assume, but I mean, you can, you, you are feel free to correct me, please do if I'm wrong, but mm-hmm. I would assume that, uh, is it easier to help a child with the psychological <clears throat> effects of abuse, like on the brain? Is it easier to help because their brain is still developing or does that make it more difficult? You know, I, I don't work with children. I work with um, teens and, and, and young adults. So there's a specific type of um, therapy used for children oh. called, called play therapy, which is not the same type of techniques used with teens and young adults. It's a different type of therapy. And this is one of the, th- and there are like specialized therapists that are play therapists that work with younger children. Okay. And it's a, it's a different type of training. It's definitely right. a different type of therapeutic training. Um, for me, I thought I I I find I found it harder to work with children um, in that setting um, with play therapy. There's a lot of there's a lot of wonderful child therapists and psychologists that do really do really do wonderful work with play therapy and uncover a lot of things through play that um, are uncovered and can be analyzed and decoded, um, which I find fascinating. It's something that I just never, it's not my expertise in right. working with children. Right. And working in working with teens and young adults, it's more or less like I, I'm a I'm a CBT. Um, therapist, which is I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist. So I work in the, the realms of um, under the scope of Albert Ellis, who does rational emotive behavioral therapy, where I feel like how your 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 thoughts and how you think are are connected to how you feel, which are then connected to how you behave. They kind of all kind of displays in that fashion. Now, this is not to say that it's because you have a thought and a lot of teens and a lot of um, young adults have something called intrusive thinking. Just because you have intrusive thoughts or maybe harmful thoughts doesn't necessarily mean you have to act on them. They're just thoughts. They're thoughts. And the more you try to um, suppress them or um it becomes, they become catastrophes. Like they could become, you become, they magnify. So it's just a mere fact of accepting that these are just your thoughts, that they don't have to go into a feeling or into an action if controlled. Then, you know, a lot of people say that if you, if I were to do half the things I were thinking, I'd be arrested or in jail or whatever the case may be. Right. So you don't necessarily have to act on your thoughts, they're just mere thoughts. And that's what I try to help my teens and my um, my adolescents with when it comes to intrusive thinking or harmful thinking. So I'm really glad that you brought up um, CBD or CBT, excuse me, mm-hmm. uh, because I have done both dialectical behavioral therapy mm-hmm. and cognitive behavioral therapy. And I personally have found more success, I think with the cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm-hmm. Um, is there, do you know if there's a reason for why uh, 
um, why, why one is drawn to one or the other, or, and could you describe the differences? Because the I, dif- yeah, yeah, the differences is like with, with cognitive behavioral therapy for me as a therapist, as a it just makes sense that that, that type of therapy makes sense. Like there's a lot of people that do are trained in EDMR for trauma. Um, I have mixed reviews. I get mixed reviews on that type of therapy. It's not something that I'm trained in. It's not something that I'm an expert in in EDMR, but I, for some people, it really does help them with their trauma. And for some people, it really just doesn't. So for the C, for the cognitive behavioral therapy, it makes sense because our thought processes in our mind are so very powerful. We underestimate it. We really do. It's probably the most powerful mechanism in our whole entire being is our, our brain. Um, and our thoughts and our thinking and our cognitions and cognitions meaning the same thing as our thinking. And when we talk about cognitions, there's a way to go about thinking about your thinking, which is called metacognitions. And this thinking about your thinking is you're really analyzing how you process, how you, how, how, what your thoughts are and what they become. So I just find it the fascinating that the, the, the thinking and the cognitions and the brain thoughts and the mind power controls typically is, has kind of like a vessel into our, into our system about how we are feeling about ourselves, how we're feeling about somebody else, our perceptions, our views, our opinions, whatever the case may be. And therefore, because of that feeling, and that belief has to be there of that feeling. We then act certain ways. We behave in certain manners. We um, interact in certain and, and um, have um, collaborations or um, um, exchanges with people in certain manners. So I just feel that that's uh, it's all very much inter interconnected and and can be controlled if you have. The skill and the training in which to utilize mind control, you could understand that if you're having any type of harmful thoughts, that they, they don't have to go into uh, a feeling or a behavior. That is something that can be controlled. Right, right. I and I, yeah, I have found <clears throat> more success with cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, like you said, some people find more success with uh, dialectical. I mm-hmm. just, it just happened to be that just is my preference is the cognitive. Right. Um, so what are like the different ways that abuse on the brain can <clears throat> manifest itself like in a human being? What is it like? What, what does it look like? What would be the signs of like severe of damage on or not damage, excuse me, um, abuse on the brain? Like how does it affect uh, your like just day to day, like interactions with other people? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I feel like there, there, there's two types of effects. There's a short-term effect that takes place, and then there's actually a long-term effect that takes place on abuse in the brain. Short-term effects that may be seen immediately can include something like the depression, having low self-esteem, damaged relationships or impaired relationships with family and friends, severe angst and anxiety. Um, feelings worthlessness, um, devalued or hopelessness, feeling like they're they have absolutely no control. These are just a few examples of some short-term side effects that um, abuse can have on on the brain. What um, in terms of <clears throat> long-term effects of abuse, mental health problems associated with past histories of childhood childhood abuse or neglect may include personality disorders, PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorders, disassociative disorders, which is what, what people do when there is a lot of trauma involved. They, dis, they, they have become a disassociative personality, depression, anxiety disorders, and some even psychosis. So <clears throat> these are some of the long-term effects in adulthood that have, have of, of abuse, if not treated early on. The best synopsis of you know, um, treatment is to recognize that there is trauma there and unresolved trauma that needs to be resolved and kind of uh, processed and, you know, and, you know, repaired. Right. 
Right. Uh, so like as an individual, <clears throat> how can we um, identify these things like consciously within ourselves, sort of like a, like, how is there something that like, like if I was gaslighted for a really long time, um, but didn't really realize that was going on, how would you be able to identify and say, okay, something happened here that I don't really, I either, my perception of it is different than what actually happened, or um, I'm, I, you know, I feel like I'm not remembering something correctly. How do we, how do you make that jump from as just like a person, uh, like walking around on the street to getting into your office? Like, how is there, is there a question that we could ask ourselves? Like there, there is, there is something. So what I'm, what I'm sensing that you're trying to, what you're trying to facilitate is how do we become aware? Yes. Like what, what yes. is, how do we, how do we recognize? So, so that's, that's, that's a challenging question because people do it in so many different ways. They come into epiphanies or recognitions or awareness in so many different ways. When I interviewed my survivors of domestic abuse, what, how they became aware of their abuse. So they weren't aware that they were being abused while they were in the abusive relationship. Right. They weren't aware they were being gaslighted. They weren't aware that they were being manipulated. They knew something was wrong though. Right. They knew so it did, something didn't feel right. Mm -hmm. So it, what they started doing is typically is they started researching. They did their own kind of bibliography, kind of therapy. They went on platforms and they went on um, different types of um, groups online and they would actually they would a lot of them wouldn't participate because they don't want to but they would hear so many similar stories of what they were going through and then they realize what am I doing here I am in a I'm in a situation Right. And that's, that's when there was a whole, a level of awareness that took place. Like that was a level of like recognition that, okay, I am feeling a lot of these other people, these other women are feeling, or, or even men who are abused feeling. And <clears throat> I really need to like get into the know of what I'm in because typically abuse happens in, 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 in relationships, you just don't wake up and you get like abused. So just specifically not how it works. Um, what usually ends up happening is that there is a, a natural progression and a sudden, uh, like a subtleness that takes place um, that just grows over time. And, and before you know it, you're in uh, almost a lot of these women were in life and death situations. Um, so what they did is they realized that something was wrong. And so they did their own research on their computers and platforms like the platform that you have is educational and informational um, to get people into the know and recognize. And then they what they what they end up doing is they either they talk to their informal supports, their family, their friends, their, you know, whomever. And what happened, what typically happened is their, the, the victim's friends would lead them to their formal supports, which are therapists, which are in crisis situation would be law enforcement. Um, and, you know, if, if there were injuries, it would be a medical practitioner if someone was uh, re religious in nature and spiritual in na nature, it would be the clergy, their pastor or priest. So it's 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 the supports of informal and formal supports then become um, more used and apparent. Okay. Okay. That's that makes sense. <clears throat> okay, that makes sense to me. Um, so, what are do you have a favorite uh, treatment? Or do you have a collection of things that you like to try when somebody walks into your office and says, I don't really know what's going on, but I can't remember like big chunks of my life. Like mm -hmm. I, I need help, basically. Mm -hmm. What what is what are your like go to things that you like to start with? And then like long term, what do you like to do? I, I try to um I, what I end up doing is I end up trying to have them recall or recollect the earliest thing that they remember. And then from, from that, 
from their statement, all this is individualized. So when a person comes in, it's not going to be the same as one person to the other person. It's very, it's not cookie cutter like that. It's very, very individualized. So I take what one recollection is, and I try to facilitate some assimilation or words to get their mind to trigger, you know, and, and jog that memory. And absolutely what I end up doing is most of the time I actually have them just freelance writing and journaling, um, which triggers a lot of stuff. Just, I tell, I tell them, don't put the pen down. Just, just write, just write, 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 write. <clears throat> Do not put the pen down and things will start, you know, when you're free, when your consciousness is freed up, you know, and unblocked, you would be surprised of what will come to paper to pen, pen to paper. Um, it's just absolutely amazing. So what I have as homework, and I always give my clients homework and I always give them things to implement and try to work on and come back and say, Dr. Michelle, this is what worked. This is what didn't work. And then we, we modify Right. We we individualize, and that's how the strategy and the technique takes place on on how to become more individualized and versus cookie cutter. So it's finding that first ability to recall and getting get it's almost like getting getting it warmed up, like you're mm-hmm. warming you're warming the engine up for more and more recall. Now I have to also, at the same token, emotionally prepare them for recalling some trauma because what happens is if they're not emotionally prepared what is something that could be ha- happen it's called emotional flooding um which i like to call emotional flooding where the now the floodgates have opened up mm-hmm. and now they're bombarded with all these different types of feelings and emotions and they are now in crisis they do not know what to do with this. So I have to methodically and carefully prepare them um, systematically mm-hmm. little bit by little bit to unleash the gate, not all at once, but a little, 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 that little openings at a time. Um, because I don't, I definitely don't want to, for my clients to be emotionally flooded um, at once because they can't, they don't have a handle on all these different types of overwhelming emotions at one time. It's just too, it's way too much. So I try to emotionally prepare them. Then when we start to unlock and we start to unleash a little bit, um, prepare them emotionally that this is, this may, this may come to you emotionally. If it does, we, 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 we need to bring that in and we need to work through the emotions along with the unleashing of memory. Okay. Okay. Uh, that sounds really scary. <laughs> um, I don't know. But it's, but, but you have, the, ther- the therapist has to do it in a way that makes it almost like a safety net for the client, you know? So the, the, the client, the relationship with the client and the therapist is very important. And that relationship, they need to feel comfortable and trusting of the, th- of the clinician to utilize the clinician as a safety net for them to open up emotionally and to unlock some of these memories. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, would you mind giving our listeners, uh, a little bit about like the homework that you give? Because, um, I do feel like there is a certain amount of stuff that, uh, some people aren't quite ready yet to maybe, breach that threshold with a therapist, but are there, is there anything that somebody can do for themselves? Um, just like right now that like is homework that you would give to help kind of open this up or do you, cause I would assume that this is really work that needs to be done in a professional setting. Uh, but is there anything that, uh, somebody could do like right now on their own? So, I mean, I definitely feel like if there is, um, if they do start doing something now, I just, they, they have to be like emotionally prepared for Mm -hmm. any type of, so I definitely feel like it would be more, it would be safer for them to, if they, if they feel like something is wrong, they know, they don't know really what it is. They Mm -hmm. feel something is wrong. There's a presenting issue happening instead of trying to do it on their own and then reap the consequences emotionally thereafter, which is can lead to some unsafetyness and, and you no know, 
with some, some challenges, I would, you know, I would reach out to a therapist once you, once there's recognition and some type of, you know, remembrance of that something is wrong and some things have to be worked through and stopping them and impeding their level of functioning in the here and now, uh, seek a therapist, build a relationship with that therapist. And if they've never been through the therapeutic process before, which a lot of people have not and are nervous Mm-hmm. on making that call um, as the therapist who receives any type of call, regardless of how booked or your, how tight your schedule is, you should always call clients back that are reaching out for help. <clears throat> you would be amazed about <clears throat> how many clients call me and try to get into my schedule and I call them back and they have called already 20 therapists who have not called them back. And so it's, it's disheartening for the client because they, they, they're needing the help. They're wanting the help. And the last, the, 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 the least thing the therapist could do is call the client back and say, this is my first availability. If it's something immediate that needs immediate attention, I would, I would think about going to maybe a community mental health center or trying out another therapist that has sooner availability if it can wait and you can hold off, we'll get you on the books and we'll, we'll, we'll book you consecutively thereafter. But making that call is probably the hardest call to make for a client. So when it's not reciprocated or called back, it dis, it makes the client very, very disheartened. Right, right. Because I, I, I can see that that would be the scariest step that first at, step, at, you know, it is, it is, it's a very, it's a very scary step. step. If in, in what I offer <clears throat> in my practice is if no one has, ever, and if a client calls me and they've never been through the therapeutic process, what I end up doing is I do, I ask them if they're interested in doing a 30 minute consultation free, a 30 minute free consultation with me to see if it's a good fit for them, you know? And so that, that in itself is extremely helpful tactic for the client to, to understand a little bit, because I educate them a little bit about the therapeutic process. I educate them about me and my approach. I educate them on what to expect. So when they come to the first session, they're nervous. They're not as nervous. They can alleviate some of that anxiety. Um, the first session that I typically have is a 60 minute session. And it's basically an intake where I ask kinds of questions about their biology, their psychology, and their social, the social functioning. It's a, it's called a biopsychosocial. It's an intake that I do. So the first session I let them know is not therapeutic in nature. It's more information gathering for me. Mm-hmm. And that first session, you'd be amazed about asking those structured session, those stru- structured questions and getting a bit of a history then builds rapport um, and having the client open up a little bit and talk about some of the things that they have gone through and what the, the what brings them into therapy and what the, what they hope to get out of therapy, you know? So that 30 minute uh, free consultation is almost an invitation, a little, a little, a little uh, to alleviate any anticipatory anxiety that they might have with beginning the process and really understanding um, the therapeutic, my therapeutic approach. And it's extremely helpful for the client. Oh, absolutely. I can totally see how that would be very helpful and reassuring and comforting. Yes. Too. Um, yes. Because it, it would really, it, at least for me, it would give me a sense of this is a safe space. This yes. is, and, uh, and I feel comfortable here. So that's, you know, that's amazing. Ab- Ab- Abigail, honestly, when I have my first session and a first few sessions, I ask them, especially in my first session, after I'm done with my intake, I ask them, I want to ask, do you have any questions for me? And typically they, they don't, sometimes they do. Um, and then I, I go, is it okay if I ask you a question? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, do you feel comfortable within speaking with me? You, what, let's gauge your comfortability level. Like I need to, I mean, make, make sure that you are, you're comfortable with opening up and talking to me because that's going to be 
That's important feedback for me. And typically they say yes. Sometimes if they're unsure, they say right now I do, you know, because they're fearful of what is to come. Mm -hmm. So I try to alleviate any type of anxiety that might, and try to make them as comfortable as they possibly can. Because when someone's comfortable, they're more opt to open up and communicate more versus a shutdown. Right. Right. And that's the, the goal I would assume that's the, that is, the is goal. to open up and be able to effectively, or maybe not effectively at first, but just be able to communicate something at first communicate some communicate something and that's why the structured intake is so so good because it's it's they don't have to do a whole they they're just trying to give me a history right. and i'm trying to get i'm trying to get a background and that's that's helpful for them and a lot of therapists don't do that a lot of therapists just get go into like why are you here you know what brings you in? You know, right. I, I start from, from the get-go. I get, I talk, I, I assess their family history, their sleep patterns, their eating, their diet. I assess their medical history. I assess, I assess their surgeries. I assess, you know, their relationships, their dating, their marriages, their pregnancies, their, you know, hormonal levels for females, you know, uh, and, and for males, you know, I assess all that at the first session. And sometimes I don't get it to all completed in an hour. So I, I stop at an hour and have to table so we can finish the session, the intake and a second session. And then from the, from the first session into the second session, I devise um, target areas that we need to attack in priority. Right. Right. That's awesome. Um, I wanted to go back just a second for, uh, sometimes we use big words on this podcast, but I wanted to, if you could clarify just a little bit, what, but what the biosocial, uh, the biopsychosocial, is that correct? The biopsychosocial? Yeah. Uh, biopsychosocial. Could you, it, it, yeah. Could it you talks clarify? About the, yeah. Sure. It talks about the biology, which is a bio of the person, okay. like meaning their medical, their, um, their surgeries, they're allergic, their allergies, their, their, um, their medical history and right. the psychology, but bio psycho psycho is the psychology of the person, why they're here, mm -hmm. their symptoms, their, 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 um, the signs and symptoms that they're experiencing. Like they'll ask me and they'll say, I am feeling depression. I'm feeling depression. Well, tell, describe what your depression, like I, I, depression may look so many different ways right. and so many for people. So I asked them to describe what their depression looks like. Some say, you know, I have problems sleeping. I have crying spells. I don't eat. I eat too much. You know, I, I asked them to go into specifics. Mm -hmm. I try to get them to get as specific as possible. They start off with generalizations. Like I'm feeling anxious. What is that? What does, what does anxiety mean? What does it look like for you? What does anxiety look like for you? So they, are explanatory to me. So I can, because like I said, this is all very individualized. There's mm -hmm. no cookie cutter way of doing this. Everyone is so different and they come in with same problems, but different manifestations of them, you know? So it's just completely individualized. So that's the psycho, that's the psychology of the, the intake and the biopsychosocial, the social is your friends, your family, your, um, your relationships, your, do you, you know, do you, what, what is, what does a typical day look like for you? Their routines, their, um, all this, all this stuff. So that's, it's really about the biology, the psychology and the social, social, social aspects of a person collected in a, in an intake form. Um, which is about seven pages long that I collect from them so I can get more of a history and background. Perfect. That's it. And I, I, I do let, the, I do let them know, like the first session, I want you to understand it's not going to be very therapeutic in nature. It's just me gathering information from you. Right. Right. But I, I feel like that's good. Like it does sound very tedious, but it is all necessary. Like that's, yes. uh, there, there are benefits to doing it this way. And it, um, I would assume that down, like down along the line, it helps to speed up the process to be able to identify certain things. 
Well, it also, it also, you know, when you, when anytime when a therapist and for me, at least when I get ready to have my second session or my third session, I review everything and I take notes based on the intake that I've done to what, what sort of things that I can target. So I can always refer back to the original background. So it, it's, it's just a great technique and strategy for therapists to use on their clients to really target the presenting issue and try to nail it down, get really specific with it and provide, provide support and treatment around that. Yeah, absolutely. That's, um, that's amazing. (laughs) Thank you for doing all of that. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, that's really important work. Uh, so what have you found are like, you, you mentioned that you, you specifically work with like first responders, like that's really where your area is and young adults and teenagers. Um, is there a common, what you, you mentioned that uh, with your book that there was like, they all kind of said the same thing. Could you talk a little bit about it? Like what were the similarities in, cause like you said, it's been, it's so individualized, but it's also, um, there does seem to be a common thread. Could you talk a there little bit is. about that? Yeah. So when, with the survivors of domestic abuse, when I interviewed them, there's something called saturation of data. And when saturation of data happens, it's like that's a, you're hearing similar recollections. For instance, many of my survivors that experienced having to call law enforcement to help them, mm-hmm. they found that the law enforcement officer, particularly the, depending on the gender, a male gender, um, was not very empathetic and not very... Um, sympathetic to the victim's um, statements and their needs. So I, I felt like all, all of my, all my survivors that in, were um, had to reach out to law enforcement said the same thing that, that law enforcement needs empathy training and sensitivity training when dealing with victim population. That's, that's one thing that was common thread. The next common thread is it was interesting for me that was a, a huge kind of correlation and discovery is a lot of my survivors that I interviewed had very, very much emotionally detached relationships with their mothers. Almost all of them did, um, which I found fascinating. Oh. Um, meaning that their, their mothers were there tangibly for them versus like, uh, finances or like babysitting or transportation or location, but that's really not what so much the victim needed their mother to be. They needed their mother to be emotionally available to them. And a lot of the mothers were not. And so, and then what you have is a generational cycle of violence where a lot of these daughters that were, that were victims saw their mothers become being victims as well. And so there's something in psychology called learned helplessness that is passed from generation to generation. And the daughter got to, you know, had pervy to see their mother become victimized and have the victim mentality and become in an abusive relationship and learned because their, their mothers were not emotionally available to them as daughters, their daughters sought out a uh, uh, similar toxic relationships in their intimate partner relationships. Right. So it's that it, it gets into that cycle of, yes. Okay. Okay. That's yes. Yes. yeah. Um, so what other than like going to therapy being one of the biggest and probably one of the scariest steps in that process for an individual, I would assume, um, is there any way to, to be able to effectively communicate to like a first responder in a violent situation or a um, when a first responder has to be called? Is there any way that somebody could like affect what is the most effective way to communicate like I am not OK and I need help? Yeah. With, how do you how do you effectively communicate that without um, because like you said, emotional regulation is hard sometimes. <laughs> um, and so like, yes, is there, yes. is there so, a way? Yeah. So when, when, a, when a victim calls first responder, it's usually because they are in the midst of getting abused. Okay. Um, so they're in the midst of 
getting uh, uh, targeted and um, violated against. So that's when law enforcement comes. And sometimes because, because um, victims have emotional traumatic bonding with um, traumatic, I'm sorry, traumatic emotional bonding with their perpetrator, law enforcement officers who are called to the scene of a DV um, call is probably the most dangerous call to be at because you just never, the, the, the law enforcement officer never knows what to expect. They come in, they get called from the victim. The, vic the police officer comes to the scene. They take, they take, hopefully they do an appropriate investigation, which I talk about and how to, how to go about doing that in the book. And <clears throat> then they, they take the statement from the victim and when that's up happening is that there is signs that have to be tangible signs of abuse. And if there are, then the perpetrator gets arrested. Now, with this being said, because fear of retaliation, the emotional traumatic bonding, what ends up happening is victims typically attack the law enforcement officer that's arresting their perpetrator or fear. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's a very kind of convoluted kind of situation. And sometimes they don't. Sometimes the, vic the victim is at that point is in emotional distress. Okay. So um, this, is, this is where sensitivity and empathy comes in for the law enforcement who's responding to the victim. That's when that needs to happen. They are in emotional crisis. Could you? And so. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, could you explain a little bit about what that looks like, just so that somebody could be aware if you're an outsider looking in what that looks like emotional distress? So. Yes. So emotional distress would be like um, blaming themselves, super anxious, like almost like to the point of frenzy, like frantic, okay. um, having so much fear and phobia and feelings of like like they're like they're going to get they're going to they're going to get retaliated against like mm -hmm. almost like a threat to their themselves the person um it's just a it's a heightened level of emotionality when the police officers come to the calls and um it's there's no type of rationality there's no type of logic it's pure heightened emotion and now what the law enforcement officer needs to be trained to do, and a lot of them are starting to do this, is really de learning verbal de-escalation. And, you know, that is, that is when they try to talk, diffuse the emotions so we can get to the understanding of what's really going on in the dynamic. But at the time of call, <coughs> excuse me, at the time of call, it's emotional heightened, right. <coughs> right. Emotion. Right. It's heightened emotions. Um, I would almost, uh, I would, I, I would almost sort <clears throat> of equate it to having an incredibly severe panic attack. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's, that, that, that's what they're in. They're in, they're in panic mode. They're in distress They're in, they're actually in survivor mode. Right. Right. Um, so is there anything that like we as individuals and a society and, and, and <clears throat> as well as like a society that we can do to help educate ourselves and um, be more aware of these like sort of signs and symptoms and be support for everybody yeah. in this situation. Is there anything that we can do? Yeah, I think a, a level of a societal acceptance okay. and versus stigmatization as is in the realm of starting to take place. Like people are really taking mental health very, very seriously as they should have been 20 years ago. Um, mental health has always been a huge um, a sphere to kind of really like make sure that it's intact. Because if you don't have your mental health, you're not going to be able to hold down a job. You're not going to be able to function. Your, your, your well-being's in jeopardy. So, I mean, your mental health and now people after pandemic are really understanding how important mental health is 
And you see it in society that people are in crisis. So you hear it on the news. All you have to do is flip on the news. All you have to do is turn on the news. And when I was in school, you know, I didn't go to school to learn of how to deal with victims in a school shooting. I didn't go to school learning how to help people through a pandemic. That is all additional training that I have to do to educate myself as a provider and a support system on how to help people that are suffering. And in all my years of doing counseling, people are really, really suffering right now. Yeah. They really are. And it's, it's really, it's really something that I've, I've, I had to adapt and adjust my approach and my therapeutic tools and techniques in order to provide the most effective support and, and treatment that I can give my clientele. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And it sounds like you're doing an absolutely wonderful job and thank Thank you you. so much. Thank you so Um, much. Well, I won't keep you any longer, but could you just tell everybody one last time about your book and about yourself so that they can go out and get your book and read it and hopefully get a little bit more education about this topic? Absolutely. So my book is, can be found on Amazon or the publishing company called Rutledge Taylor and Francis um, group. It's called surviving domestic abuse, formal and informal supports and services. And I have a, I do have a website. It's www.drmichellefinneran.com. And on, on the website, if you just, if you could just Google Dr. Michelle Finneran, my website will come up and on the website, there are blogs, there are videos, there are, there's, I have an Instagram account. I have a Facebook account. I have a LinkedIn account. I have, but on my website, it's, and there's a lot of information. There's a way to purchase the book. There's a way to read the blogs. Uh, I do blogging um, once a week. Um, so it's just, it's a good kind of resource for audiences and for people to kind of get in to more of a sphere of getting into the now. Yeah, absolutely. And everybody, please go check out her book and her website. These are all really, really important and good tools um, to share with other people. Um, You don't necessarily need to be um, a victim or a survivor uh, in order to get educated about this topic. Absolutely. I think people that are providing anybody, any type of services for victims need to get the book providers, um, formal supports, informal supports, anybody who's dealing with somebody who's dealing with abuse, really it's the, 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 the book is not just for survivors and victims, but it's for people that are helping yes. survivors and victims. So I, I will send you Abigail, all those, that information on uh, email to you. So you can post it on your, um, on your site when the, when the episode is um, released. Oh, I, and I definitely will, um, just to let everybody know, uh, again, <clears throat> that this is, some, this is a very important and serious topic. Um, and we can all help and we can all do Absolutely. something. And even if it's, the, even if that's just reading a book, uh, reading your book, uh, that's, mm-hmm. you know, it's a start and we're getting somewhere. Absolutely. Cause in the book on each, on each chapter, there are recommendations for anyone who is There's recommendations for people that are in law enforcement. There's recommendations for people that are um, counselors. There's recommendations for people that are friends and family and clergy and uh, the system that give recommendations for the system to help as a whole. And hopefully those recommendations will be taken um, to heart and when dealing with this, this population. Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, Well, thank you so much for joining me. I had such a good time talking to you. I learned so much. Thank you so much for coming on. I won't keep you any longer. Thank you so much, Abigail, for having me on your important podcast. And again, this is a great avenue to get educated on. Absolutely. Thank you so much. You're Um, welcome. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.